All right, we're going. Hello, everybody. Welcome in and welcome back to another episode of the Ryan's Ramble podcast. My name is Ryan Bennell, and I'm your host throughout this series. If you're unfamiliar with who exactly I am, well, let me introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ryan. I am an associate editor over at Frogs of War. Been here for about a year now. Uh, and just mentioning Frogs of War, always want to take the opportunity to give a huge shout out to everybody involved with Frogs of War. Melissa, Jamie, always super thankful for the opportunity I have here on this podcast on the Frogs of War Network. Get to talk about a lot of things that I normally wouldn't get to, and today is going to be one of them. Uh, we're going to be talking about Gary a little bit. I know this is a gambling podcast, uh, but I have to. I can't I can't just go this week without talking about the Gary situation. Uh, as you all know, Gary Patterson is no longer the head coach of TCU football. We'll get into that in a second. But if you are unfamiliar with what this podcast is, shame on you. This is episode 12. Where have you been all this time? But just kidding. Anyway, this is your one-stop shop at Frogs War for all of your sports betting needs. Right now, we're hammering college football. Sooner or later, we'll get on to college basketball as well because it's starting next week. And I'm hyped. TCU just had their purple-white scrimmage. Got a lot of new transfers and a lot of new guys that look pretty good. Shahada Wells was balling out. That's a name to look out for. And, of course, Micah Pavey. But we're not here to talk basketball yet. We're here to talk football, college football in particular, and make some picks, make some winners. So in case you could tell by the titles of late, today is going to be a special title because, you know, Gary, I had to. But the titles as of lately, such as, I don't know, Hotter Than a Hot Potato, Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner, super clever, I know, right? But I'm winning a lot right now. So we're making picks. We've now won seven weeks in a row, which is just, I don't I can't fathom it. I'm okay with it. It's not like I'm going 10 and 0 every week, okay? I'm getting like plus 1, plus 3 units per week, but it's a slowly but surely building it up, getting that win percentage up there and that's the goal, you know, just finish the season above 50%. So far so good. We only got like 5 more weeks left in the regular season, I think. So, knock on wood. I got it. Knock on my hardwood floor now. I just jinxed myself. Damn. But before we get into the actual gambling section, we're going to talk, as always, about some things we learned last week. But this week is different. Um, I just mentioned it a second ago. Gary Patterson, no longer the head coach of TCU football. And I just want to give my take. I'm sure you've heard plenty of takes. I'm sure you've heard plenty of, you know, potential coaching candidate scenarios. But this, this And everybody has their own personal stories with Gary, right? Everybody has their own personal connection, meaning behind why he's so important to you, not only to TCU, but to you individually. And my entire life, again, if you guys don't know who I am, I'm, I'm a student right now still. I am a senior at TCU. So literally, quite literally, my entire life, Gary Patterson has been the head coach of TCU. Not only has he been the head coach of TCU, he's been the face of the program, the face of the university, and one of the faces of Fort Worth as a whole. I mean, the stuff he did for the community, I could go on and on about the cliches, about everything Gary did, how he built this program, but you guys all know that, right? You guys know how special he is, but man, I'll just, I'll never forget all the moments, man, all the memories we got. When I was growing up, meeting him at, at Meet the Frogs, you know, those autograph signings and everything, uh, getting to take my picture with him. I'm, I've been trying to look back to find some super old timey pictures of me when I was like five with Gary at the autograph signings like, yay. But we'll see if I can come across one. But and there's just countless, countless memories like that. And he always says it, too, in his press conferences. There's a difference between Coach Gary and Gary. And. To an extent, with all college coaches, that has to be true. I mean, you, you know, you're doing your job. You gotta gotta get on your guys sometimes. You know, Gary infamously has the coarse voice after everything, but it's because he's damn good at his job. He's doing what he got to do to get his guys in position to win. And unfortunately, as of late, that hasn't been happening. Uh, and so now, just I can't stop thinking about the Rose Bowl game. The you know all the changing shirts at the Alamo Bowl. Just all these memories of Gary, all the, the great players he's coached, you know, sending like Jason Verrett to the league, Jerry Hughes, who became a captain, a longtime captain in the NFL. Andy Dalton was a starter for a decade. He 
He's taken, you can look at too, like Josh Jackson, guy that was actually, now that I think about it, I'm not sure. I think he was a one star recruit, low, very low touted recruit coming out of high school, gave him a shot, turned him into a first round draft pick. Like, that's bonkers. And then you could talk about Trayvon Boykin, even though he had a bit of a fallout in the pros personally. I mean, look at what Gary did. Gary was playing him at wide receiver, running back, quarterback. He went from being having the lowest QBR in all of college football to one year later, he was a Heisman candidate. And that's, of course, that's because he's an athlete. He's talented, but it's also great coaching, great leadership, everything like that. But it's it's actually interesting how this all went down. So again, if you guys don't already, how this went down, nobody was directly fired. There was no ill will, nothing like that. But essentially, ADJD, Jeremiah Donati, and Chancellor Boschini met up with Gary, basically informed him that they will be moving on at the end of the season uh, and will be finding a new coach for 2022. But, and there's a big but, they offered Gary a position, an advisory role within the athletics department, specifically the football team, I would assume. But, and in turn, Gary respectfully declined this offer and said he would like to mutually part ways. Uh, that way he can search for another job. And he also felt like it was more suiting or more fit that he leave the team now rather than coach them until the end of the season, which is just, it's crazy. It's crazy that it actually happened that way. I mean, at the beginning of the season, this was supposed to be our year. People were talking about 10 win season competing for the big 12 title. The delusional fans like myself were talking about a potential playoff run. I, it, it happens. Okay. After a few years of mediocrity, you get excited. Not this year. And the irony of this whole thing is that Gary has built these expectations. Gary is the one that built this program. We all know that that's a fact. He built these expectations. He built the, the norm of winning games, making bowl games, competing for conference championships. And the irony of it is now he's not living up to his the own standards that he set. And it's, it's, it's just sad to see it happen this way. I would have assumed that, you know, he would be let go at the end of the season, in between seasons, something along those lines. Let the story tale ending ride out into the sunset. But, you know. Sometimes story tales, uh, they run out of magic before the last chapter, and that seems to be the case with our buddy Gary. I'm I'm trying not to be too, you know, like biased on it because, I mean, obviously it sucks. Like, do I think this was the right decision? Yes and no. I would have rather had it go differently. I would have rather him, you know, ride off into the sunset with a, a nice send-off, like I mentioned. But I, I do think it was possibly time for a change uh like i was saying at the beginning of the year this was our year we were supposed to get 10 wins compete and then we just flat out we're arguably one of the most disappointing teams in all of college football not even just for us just in the entire landscape we shit the bed this year and it's crazy though because i would have never expected gary's job security to be at stake like at all really come the beginning of the season and then after that West Virginia loss, I was like, oh, maybe maybe the haters have a point. Because, you know, there's been Gary haters. There's been people calling for his job. And those people are idiots. And the people that are thankful that he's gone and, like, praising hallelujah, idiots. All right? This man has done everything for the university. He deserves whatever he wants. He, he If he wants to leave, let him leave. If he wants – actually, no, we're not going to get into the – I don't know the contract situation, so I can't really say – he wants $10 million, give him $10 million, let the man do what he wants. But he deserves all of your respect. Um, I hate seeing Gary hate on my timeline, especially from students, because like maybe it's just because I've grown up with bleeding purple, but I hate when students shit on Gary. I'm just like, you don't even know, okay? You don't know how much he means to us. You don't know how important he is. But yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm just sad. It, also, in the press conference recently, I, I went to the uh, one with AD, JD, and um, Coach Kill, Coach Jerry Kill, the new interim coach. And my biggest takeaway really was it seems like, one, Gary is for sure going to be coaching somewhere else. He will likely be a head coach again in the near future. Um, could you imagine if it's somebody we have to play? God, that'd be so weird. But... And then my other takeaway was it seems like they will be moving towards an offensive-minded candidate for the head coaching position. So 
With that being said, I wanted to give my two cents on the head coaching candidates. I know there's been a million what if articles, potential scenarios, yada, yada. But you know what? My name's in the podcast. I want to tell you what coaches I want. (laughs) First off, I'm going to start with my unrealistic options because these are more fun to me and I would love any of these to happen. So first up, Lane Kiffin. There's a reason why it's on my unrealistic options. Like this is definitely super far-fetched, not going to happen. But I don't know. Lane Kiffin likes to bounce around around like a little Easter bunny. He just hops over from places, but typically it's in the SEC. So, and also we'd have to pay that man like $10 million a year to come here. So very unrealistic, but it would be electric. I would love having his offensive mind as our head coach. It would be interesting to see how that worked out. Next up, I have Coach O. Ed Orgeron, no Tigers, baby. He is done being the LSU coach at the end of the season. Will TCU hire him after his recent antics in the media and falling out? Probably never. Um, But it would be, just for the meme's sake, it would be great. And, I mean, let's not act like Coach O's not a fantastic coach. He's He put together one of – he led one of arguably the greatest college football team of all time, 2019 LSU. And then my last unrealistic candidate, which has slowly but surely gotten more realistic as time has gone on, is Kellen Moore. He's next in line to be the next NFL coach. Pretty hot commodity in both college football and the NFL, I guess, now. But apparently his people reached out to TCU. Apparently it's a possibility they're going to at least be in contact. But again, I'd give that like a 1% chance. Now for my realistic options... I got Sonny Dykes. This name you've heard a lot. He's probably the front runner. A very unique offensive mind. He has deep Texas recruiting ties. He does a great job of bringing in big name transfers. I mean, like they've got Tanner Mordecai right now. And the best part of it all is it would be a slap in the face to our little brothers in Dallas at SMU. We would just take their guy, basically prove to them that we're the better job. Obviously, we're more sought after. Who would want to work for little old SMU when you can work when you can wear the purple and white, I mean, come on. Other than Sonny Dykes, I would say Billy Napier would be my other realistic option that I'd be pretty happy with. Uh, dude turned Louisiana around. I mean, you look at their record beforehand, it was like, what, like 25 and 70 or something. And then now with him, they're like 36 and 10. Those numbers are definitely not exact, so don't quote me on that. But something ridiculous like that, he has had a huge impact on that program. Also coached at Clemson and Alabama. He's got the experience. He knows what he's doing. I would like to see him come to TCU, especially because he doesn't need to turn around the program. You know, he's in a big conference. He would be in a big conference again. He would just be able to run with it, run with what we've got, and build upon it. Gary set all this stuff up, and we could still be successful in the near future within like two years if it's the right hire. And then my dart throw, <coughs> Ooh, excuse me, my dart throw of a candidate would be Deion Sanders, which is just a joke, but it's actually kind of wild because 24 seven sports reported it. I've seen a few people report it that uh, Deion Sanders and TCU are working to set up an interview right now. My question is, how is this actually happening? Like this was, this started as a joke and now it's actually a a possibility. I don't, I don't know. Would ADJD do that? I kind of want to see what would happen with Deion as our coach. Part of me does like the fun side of me does, but the realistic, I want to win football game side of me says, eh, maybe let's go with like Billy Napier. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I've been congested all week and some uh, coughs going on, (coughs) but the show must go on. No beer tonight. Just a water. (sighs) Got to stay hydrated, you know? All right, anyway, let's go ahead and hit some things we learned last week before we get into the official card. As always, we're going to start out. My first thing I learned, this is uh, what I like to do, talk about some major realizations, big talking points from the last week in the college football uh, that I can apply to my future endeavors, my future picks and whatnot. And first up, the college football playoff committee is dumb. I hate them. I want to just completely eradicate them, get rid of them. I could do a better job than all of them in my sleep. Um, Oregon at number four, Oklahoma at number eight, 
are super unexpected, but those aren't even the ones I'm the most mad about. Alabama at number two, a one loss Alabama. Literally all of the, all of their rankings are just to justify their other rankings. For example, Oregon at number four, which I'm actually not super mad at, but they have one loss to Stanford in a, how are they going to be four spots ahead of an undefeated Oklahoma in a power five conference? That doesn't make sense, but you know why Oregon's number four? It's because they had to put Ohio state in the top five. And to justify that Oregon beat Ohio state, got to put Oregon in the top four. Boom. Simple. That's how it works. I, I, I really hate them. Um, there's six teams in the AP top 25 that are not in the college football playoff. And you want to know a trend? Super shocker. Five of those six teams are group of five teams. Uh, the group of five is getting absolutely no respect. Only two of them are ranked. None of them, well, excluding Cincinnati. This shouldn't even count. But other than Cincinnati, none of the American Athletic Conference teams are ranked. Only um, it's two Mountain West teams, San Diego State and Fresno State. I'm trying to just picture it off the top of my head. And that, to me, is weird that the Mountain West is getting more respect than the AAC this year. Uh, Cincinnati, again, that's another big Met screw-up. I mean, Cincinnati at six, I just – it makes me – that brings me to my next point, okay? So my next thing we learned is that Cincinnati is screwed. I hate to say it. I, I don't see a, a scenario – here, I'm, I'm a visual, visual, ugh, visual learner. Let's see, college football playoff top 25. I got to just pull it up. You know, I'm a visual learner. Got to talk about all these scenarios. Okay, so Cincinnati at six. They're screwed. That That's one thing we learned as well. And I hate to say it because I, I want to see them more than anybody in the college football playoff. I want to see them go undefeated, give the little guys a shot. I've said this probably every week of the podcast. I just I don't see a scenario where they get in. Honestly, based on the committee, I, I don't. I mean, there's just chaos waiting to ensue. You talk about if Alabama – in Georgia, well, th that's what's going to happen. It's going to be Alabama and Georgia in the SEC championship. No questions about it. And if Alabama wins, most likely once Alabama wins that SEC championship game, what do you do? Is it is it still Bama and Georgia? They're both going to be in there. You know they are. They're, they're going to put both SEC teams in there. So there's Georgia and Bama already. Then look at what if Ohio State wins out. But then what if also – um Oregon wins out is it just Oregon and Ohio State to take those spots but then you got to look at two Wake Forest if Wake Forest goes undefeated that's an undefeated ACC champion are you just going to give them the boot for a one loss Ohio State team why because they're not Clemson that's exactly what the committee is going to do uh and then again I haven't even talked about Oklahoma they're nine and oh yes they have the hardest part of their schedule remaining but they're nine and oh ranked number eight and could you imagine them leaving out an undefeated Big 12 champion out of the playoff? Absolutely not. Also, could you imagine, this is an even wilder scenario. There's just so many possibilities here. I could go on and on. But look at, let's say, so Michigan State. Oh, wait, do they play each other? I know Ohio State plays Michigan. Does Michigan State play Ohio State? That's big. Oh, they do. Oh, contraire. Okay, well, the Big Ten is going to be an exciting finish regardless. But what, what you need to take away from that is there's no, there's really no possibility Cincinnati sneaks in. I, I don't think so. They would need Alabama to lose the SEC championship game. And hopefully, I mean, I'm hoping they wouldn't put a two-loss non-SEC champ Bama in the playoffs. That would mean probably Georgia. And that would leave your Pac-12 champion, Oregon, which I actually wouldn't be surprised if Oregon dropped a game before the end of the year. It's tough. It And then, again, what if Michigan beats Ohio State, bro? Like, so many possibilities. So much could happen. It's it's chaos, and I love it. Anyway, next up, what we learned, speaking of Big Ten, we learned that Kenneth Walker the third is a man amongst boys. His Heisman odds went from 18-1, to 1, shot up all the way to, I think, like 2-1. to 1. He is the Heisman favorite right now after putting up 23 carries 193 yards and five touchdowns against Michigan, which is absurd. He part of me hopes that a running back, I really want to see Walker 
or Sean Tucker from Syracuse. I kind of want to see them win the Heisman at this point just because of how blasphemous the preseason Heisman odds were. You had like – it was Spencer Rattler, um, JT Daniels, Sam Howell, Derek King, DJ Ukulele, all leading. And none of those guys, other than Bryce Young. Bryce Young's the only one that was there that's still up there. Matt, Matt Corral wasn't even talked about really until – the season got underway. So really bad preseason rankings and they were all quarterbacks. So I kind of want to see a running back win it, just change it up. You know, he has just under 1200 yards right now. I think it's 1194 through eight games, 15 total touchdowns, averaging 6.8 yards per carry. This dude's a beast. Not as good as Zach Evans though, but I didn't say that Zach Evans just needs to get carries, you know? So maybe who knows? Maybe, Zach Evans will be getting 30 carries a game with the with the coaching change. I don't know what uh I'm sure we'll see a very similar style with Kill as the interim coach, you know, while Gary just stepped out. We won't see any major changes until we get a new guy next year. So anyway, next up, it going into the Big 12 now, Texas. Now I could say this every week, and I could say it with a big old smile on my face. Texas is still not back. They started the year 4 0, and they're now 4 and 4. You absolutely love to see it. It's it's just beautiful. Especially if you remember in episode one, we placed a future bet on UT to finish with under eight and a half wins on the season. Now, there's absolutely no scenario, even if they go 4-0, win out the rest of the year, that they don't – or that they hit the over. So that's a cash bet already. Makes me curious now. I'm going to look up their schedule, Texas football schedule. Let's see their remaining four games. Can they even make a bowl game? They're four and four. Play Iowa State in Ames. That's tough. It, Iowa State's favored by seven, I think. So that might be a loss. That'd be four and five. Then you got Kansas. Can't can't say Kansas is a freebie for Texas. I mean, if history repeats itself. <laughs> and then we got West Virginia on the road. That's really tough. Honestly, there's there's a, there's a legitimate chance that Texas finishes five and seven. There's a legit chance. I could see them. They're probably going to beat Kansas. Let's be real. But I could actually see them losing to Iowa State this weekend. I think they will. I see them losing to West Virginia on the road. And then Kansas State at home. That, that It might come down to that. That might be their bowl game or bust game. That's crazy to think. I love it. Love to see that. They had a 31-24 loss at Baylor last weekend in a game that a lot of people thought they should have been favorited in, despite Baylor was, I think, three-and-a-half point favorites. And with that being said, I still can't tell whether Baylor's good or not. They're they're a hard team to pin, but clearly they're playing better than the Frogs right now. They got the number 12 ranking. I can't talk shit until we beat them in the Carter, baby. Oh, damn. It's already been 20-something minutes. I really got to get to these picks. Anyway, what else we learned is I already kind of touched on this, so I won't get into it too hard, but the Big Ten is the conference to watch. Um, SEC is obviously going to be Bama, Georgia in the final or in the championship game. I mean, but you got Big Ten. The Big Ten East is crazy. Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan, all fighting for a top spot right now. And then the Big Ten West is just the complete opposite. They're all just dog shit. It's Iowa look golden, but oh boy, how the mighty have fallen. Then we got Minnesota is currently in line for the Big 12 title shot, which is absurd. And that's another team. That should not be ranked. I don't care that they're six and two. I don't. They haven't played anybody other than Ohio State, and one of their losses was a they a game they were thirty point favorites in against Bowling Green at home. At home, I might add. That pitiful. Anyway, and then Wisconsin, Purdue, and Iowa are all one game behind the Gophers. So the Big Ten West is also up for grabs right now. It, it's really a, a dice roll as to who we're going to see. In that championship game, my money would most likely be on Ohio State simply because it's Ohio State. That's what they do. And then in the Big Ten West, I would probably – I really don't know. I would like to say Iowa, but after they just got blown out by Wisconsin, I don't know what to say. Wisconsin's overrated too. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. I'm picking against them. And, uh, yeah, no matter who comes out, though, Big Ten East is going to win by, like, 30 points. It's going to be ridiculous. And then last thing we learned, and I'll just touch on this a little bit, the Pac-12 is impossible to predict. We talked about how they beat themselves up, but they beat up betters. They beat up my brain trying to predict these games because 
Utah blows out UCLA by 20, who also barely lost to Oregon. Meanwhile, Wazoo won handily over Arizona State as 17-point underdogs. But the, and Arizona State's been o- overranked all year. Then Washington beat Stanford, which is the same Stanford team that beat number four Oregon. Make, make it make sense, right? It just doesn't make sense. Pac-12 is a conundrum, and it always will be. And that's really all I have to say about that. So that is what we learned last week. Now, to round out last week, let's just touch on my picks. I really do got to get into these. It seems like every episode, we've been going longer and longer. But it's also partially just because I'm getting more comfortable at uh, talking into a screen for like 45 minutes straight, nonstop, with no co-hosts or anything. It's interesting. It's definitely an interesting vibe. But I feel like I'm talking to you guys. So that's it's whatever. Um Last week, yeah, I almost kind of lost where we were. So last week we went eight and five on 13 picks and four and zero, oh, baby, undefeated on my tier one most confident favorite bets. Now, that puts our overall record for the entire season at 63, 48, and two, which is a 56.8% win percentage, which is right there with the pros, right there with the sharps. Might as well just drop out of college and do this for a living, right? Sorry, mom, if you're listening. I didn't say that. But anyway, seven straight winning weeks. It's crazy. I don't know. I I really couldn't tell you how it's happening. But what I can tell you is I'm not going to change anything up. I'm going to do everything exactly the same way I've been doing it. We're going to go through everything. Same routine. We got to keep. I'm a little bit superstitious. So we got to keep this streak alive. Eight's my favorite number. Seven's the lucky number. We're going from luck to favorite. Seven to eight. Eight weeks in a row is coming up. But on my seventh week, we had a few close calls. (coughs) Again, excuse me. Sorry. A few of those games we had Clemson last week, minus nine, who, mind you, was 0-7 against the spread before that game started. They were up by four points, it was. And FSU was trying to put a game winning drive together with like less than a minute left. They ended up fumbling the ball as like time was expiring and Clemson picks it up, runs it back for a touchdown as time expires to cover the spread by one point. That was a really, really lucky game. Not going to lie. I kind of should be seven and six last week, but excuse me. A win is a win. We'll take it eight and five. It is. Other than that, we had another nine-point spread chosen was Pittsburgh, who got upset by Miami of all teams. That was an embarrassing pick. I was pretty confident after they had gotten their top 20 ranking. Their offense was putting up ridiculous numbers. Still did put up ridiculous numbers. That was a shootout. So anyway, and then overall, we went around 50-50, I believe, on our underdog picks. I've been a big fan of underdogs this year. I don't know why, but... We had Wazoo plus 17, which they won outright. Same thing with West Virginia, plus seven and a half against Iowa State. They won outright. And then a couple losers. We had Kentucky plus one and a half. I thought they were the better team. Still do, even though they lost the game. And then UCLA plus six and a half got obliterated by Utah. I did not see that coming. And then Wake Forest, uh, ending on a high note. <clears throat> Wake Forest stopped scoring as soon as we needed them to. Uh, In tier one last week, we had Wake Forest team total over 43 and a half. They got to 45 early in the fourth quarter and just stopped, which, hey, that's a win. It's a 1.5 point win right there. So all in all, it was a solid weekend. And I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm going to keep doing things like I've been doing. Going to go for go for gold again this week. Go for week eight in a row. (coughs) God dang, I got this tickle in my throat. Get away. (coughs) Now, I don't know if you could have heard that, but I did a drum roll. Drum roll this week is time to hit some of our picks. First up, TCU and Baylor play this weekend. Big rivalry game. Baylor are seven-point favorites as it stands, and the over-under is set at 59.5, which sounds just about right for these two teams. And uh, I don't want to get into it yet because I actually do have an official pick on this line, even though – I typically say I I stay away from betting TCU games. I did it against West Virginia. It paid off. I'm I'm gonna bet this game as well. I'm gonna do it for Gary. Gary, if if you're listening, if you're hearing this, I'm putting five units on the frogs for Gary. Maybe not five. That was a lie. 
but for Gary, I'll put five. All right, anyway, it's a lot of units. Let's start with tier three. If you're unfamiliar, tier three is my lowest confidence picks, but of course I'm I'm picking them, so I'm confident in them. Just not my favorite of the faves. So first up, this is a dumb pick. I'm just going to call it how it is. Uh, I'm taking Missouri plus 39 and a half at Georgia. And in my notes here, I have why? Because I'm an idiot and I love losing money. But no, in reality, I, I otherwise I wouldn't be picking this if I didn't think it was going to win. But this line is just preposterous. This is an FCS type game line. I'm sure Georgia would barely be favored, would probably be favored by the same amount against some random, I don't know, South Dakota State, something like that. But Mizzou is currently 0-8, completely winless against the spread this season. And if our logic with Clemson last week showed us anything, they are due to cover. It's got to correct itself to some extent. Vegas has this game projected around 50 to 10 because the over-under is 59 and a half, spreads 39 and a half. So you do the math, it's about a 50 to 10 game. And I feel like Georgia is going to stop scoring by then. I really do. I mean, other than like that onslaught of turnovers against Florida, they wouldn't have put up many points. They probably would have put up like 20. And a lot of them came in one quarter, one like flu quarter. So I don't know. I feel like Georgia is going to have to pull the backups out at some point. This should be an easy win all in all. Their defense should handle Mizzou. Uh, Mizzou's defense, though, isn't really anything to brag about. It's the only thing that makes me nervous. That's why they're my tier three. But 39 and a half points is a lot of points for a cover. So I'm going with Mizzou. Next up, switching from a spread to an over under, I'm taking Clemson at Louisville over 46 and a half. Now, this is it, this line caught my eye immediately because this is a really, really low total for a Louisville game. In their last five games, their over-unders for the Cardinals have been set at 56 and a half, 58, 69 and a half, 64 and a half, and 61. Granted, they hit the under very closely in four out of those five. This is still ridiculously no. Um, excluding that recent loss against NC State last week, and that's a good NC State team on the road, hostile environment. You can make an excuse. Um, other than that game, their offense is averaging 31.5 points per game. And we know how bad Clemson is. We know. I don't even want to talk about it. I've talked about it enough. They Sure, they got the win, right, last week. And they got 30 points. Maybe that's some sort of improvement. And that was like a milestone. 30 points was a milestone for that offense this year. And I, I don't need to dive into how bad that offense is. You guys already know. But Louisville's defense isn't much better. They're ranked 94th in total defense. And both Clemson's defense and Louisville's offense rank in the top 30. So that'll be another interesting matchup to look out for. Weather looks clear. No wind, no rain, no nothing. And so do the points. Points look clear to me. I think Louisville's pace of play, their explosive nature will lead to some points in this one. And Clemson is still good enough to compete in every game they're in. Clemson should win, I would I would hope, but I, I don't want to predict a Clemson game. That's why I'm going with the over-under. So give me the over 46 and a half. Next up, we got another underdog. I'm taking Maryland plus 10 at home versus Penn State. Now, my main reasoning behind this is because I thoroughly believe Penn State is done. Uh, the James Franklin train has left the station. He has one foot out the door. He's gone. Whether he's going to Southern California don't, don't know, don't care, probably is USC. His mind is not there. Penn State's offense as well is just not good enough to cover a double-digit spread. And meanwhile, you got Maryland. Their offense is, they, they have, they've had their moments. They have their highlights. They're averaging just under 30 points per game, which isn't phenomenal. But Tagaviola, you know, to his brother, fully capable of putting some points on the bar, points on the board. <coughs> Ugh, keeps coming back. I'm going to run out of water. I got I to gotta pace myself. All right, anyway, but yeah, Tag of the Oil can score points. Though Penn State should win this game, Maryland can definitely keep it close. This is a really a big, big, big look-ahead spot as well for Penn State. Although their Big Ten hopes are out, their playoff hopes are out of the window, they still want to make a good bowl game. And they have Michigan coming into Happy Valley next week. 
So this is a look ahead spot. Might not be too worried about Maryland on the road, but maybe they should be. I think the Turpins, their stadium is crazy. Their fans are crazy. Even when they suck, their fans are still crazy. Their student section is awesome. So I'm, I'm rolling with Maryland. As DJ Khaled would say, tag viola. I don't know if you guys know about that, but I had to say it. I had to. Is that Eric? Anyway, last pick on my tier three card is a system play. I'm going to go with Coastal Carolina at Georgia Southern under 60. Uh, the system, you might be asking, what is it? Well, it is a windy game system. So for games that have wind of like 13 to 50, there's like a whole bunch of factors that go into it. But this game fits the system. I'm taking the under of 60 because mostly because of the wind. 21.6 mile per hour winds are projected for kickoff. And when you take a team like Georgia Southern, who is a heavy run first offense, which is going to chew the clock, I think that's a good pair. You know, trust in the weather, trust in the system. It hits at a 58% rate since 2005. But the only thing that scares me and the reason it's in tier three is the fact that Coastal Carolina could very well win this game. 60 to nothing scares me, but we trust the system. All right. We trust the system play. <clears throat> now that is all for tier three. I've got Missouri plus 39 and a half at Georgia, Clemson at Louisville over 46 and a half, Maryland plus 10 versus Penn State, and Coastal Carolina at Georgia Southern under 60. <clears throat> now, tier two, tier two, where do I even begin? Ah, this is this game gave me a headache, but I wanted to pick it anyway. I think, wait, so I'm just going to say, Wake Forest plus two and a half at UNC North Carolina. It actually blows my mind that North Carolina is favored in this game, and it should blow yours too. The number nine team in the country, undefeated, going up against a very disappointing 4-4 four and four North Carolina Tar Heel team. Tell me who should be favored, just based off that sentence. Wake Forest should be favored. But this is one of those lines that, you know, sometimes Vegas knows shit. Vegas does it. They, they make the calls. This is one of those lines that scares me. I mean, it's, it's a trap line. It really is. But I'm falling for the trap. I don't care. Wake Forest is just so far the better team. There's another trap line, too, on this week's card. If you look at Michigan State, they're only three-point favorites against Purdue. What? Why? Because Vegas knows that's why. But I'm I'm still nervous about that one because Purdue is 2-0 and against top five teams under their current head coach. So I'm staying away from that one. But I'm not staying away from this one. I think Wake Forest truly is just a better team. UNC's last two home games, they've lost to Florida State, a bad Florida State team, and failed to cover the spread against Miami, barely escaped with a three-point win. The Tar Heels are 1-4 and four against the spread in their last five. Meanwhile, Wake Forest, not super crazy. They're 3-2. They're and two, But this game is going to have a, a bazillion points scored. Um, but Wake Forest's offense is just slightly better. There's going to be – defense is non-existent. Wake Forest's offense is just better. I don't think UNC will be able to compete. I think they're going to make more mistakes. You know, you got – this team was supposed to be a 10-win team, and they have losses to Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech of all teams, Florida State of all teams. Like, Notre Dame you can excuse, I guess. But the rest, I mean, 4-4, four and four, man, come on. UNC had such high hopes with Sam Howell, too, and he's not even – I have not heard Sam Howell's name since the preseason Heisman conversation. So give me Wake Forest plus two and a half to stay undefeated. They're going to the ACC championship. This is their team of destiny. Next up, I'm taking Rutgers plus 13 and a half at home against Wisconsin. Now say it with me. Overrated. Wisconsin is so overrated. It's insane. I Listen, I know they, they beat Iowa by 17, that, and good for them. Impressive win. It was deserved, you know. But Iowa's offense is just so abysmal that I don't even I don't even think it should count as a collegiate football team. Like, their offense is JV high school. Defense is, like, NFL level. It doesn't make sense, the difference. It's just polar opposite. And Wisconsin's kind of the same, though. I mean, Wisconsin's defense has been absurd. They have, I think, like, a top three rush defense. Um, but they can't put up points normally. They just can't. The fact that they put up 24 against Iowa blew my mind. But I still think the Badgers are overrated. I don't think they should be ranked. Sure, they went from one and three to five and three, but they're still a one and three team in my mind. That that, that Iowa win was their only impressive win. Ish. It was still an ish. Like 
Um, Rutgers, their offense isn't all to die for. Like I was, I was kind of you know talking shit about the Badgers' offense, but Rutgers' offense isn't all that great either. But their defense might be able to to do something, and I would have said the same with Iowa. But I mean, if you look at some saber metrics or semantics of it, the Scarlet Knights' defense has a solid thirty six and a half percent success rate allowed. They generate havoc on 18.2% of plays, which is nuts. And they hold opponents to only 3.03 points per opportunity, which is pretty solid. And reminder, this is after Rutgers played against teams like Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan. Like, they've played some tough teams, and they still have those solid defensive stats. So, who knows? And then uh, with Wisconsin, not in Camp Randall anymore. The hostile environment. Um, Rutgers, they're going to treat these type of games like it's their Super Bowl. They're going to come out and show out. I think it's going to be a really low-scoring battle. Um, Wisconsin will probably come out on top, but I think by like six, like three to six maybe. Also, another favorite reason to take this is 77% of the public bets are siding with Wisconsin, and we fade the public around here. It's just That's what we do, fade the public. All right, it's that time. You already know. TCU. Plus seven versus Baylor. I'm going with the Frogs this weekend. They're going to do it for Gary. I Yes, this might be a bit of an emotional pick. I might be swayed one way. But Baylor is in a major look-ahead spot, too. They got Oklahoma coming into town next week, which has huge implications for the Big 12 championship game, considering Baylor only has one loss right now. But it's a rivalry game, too. You know, like every, anything can happen in a rivalry game. Rivalry games are just different. Baylor right now has been killing it against the spread. They're 6-2. and two. Meanwhile, TCU is just dog water. They have covered the spread one time, and that was against Tech. Other than that, they have six losses and one push against Duquesne of all teams. So it's been rough for TCU. I think they're due. They're due for a cover plus seven. Seven points, even though it's one touchdown. Seven points is a lot of points in a rivalry game like this, especially – where we have the opportunity to ruin Baylor's season. We could screw them, essentially. Especially if Oklahoma State wins out, we could screw Baylor, which would be amazing. Um, But I don't know. I don't know. I don't really have anything else to add to it. It, It's going to be a good game. I think TCU, they're going to come out, play for Gary. The boys are going to want to get a win. And the students are going to show out. The fans are going to show out. It's going to be a good atmosphere, at least I hope. I really hope the atmosphere is good after the Gary news. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'd like to think so. I I think we can keep it close, even if Baylor comes out on top. I think we can keep it within seven points. So give me the Horn Frogs, baby. Add them to my card. Only the second time all year. Now, to round out Tier 2, I'll be taking Kansas State. Their team total over 40.5 at Kansas. Now, I know this is a lot of points. For Kansas State. But remember, they're playing Kansas. I almost took the full game over of 55.5, but I think this is a bit safer of a play. I trust Kansas State to score over 40 more than I trust Kansas to score twice. So I think both of them will probably hit, but this is just a little bit safer. K State might end up covering 55.5 on their own. So 40.5 should be a gift of a number. Um, Kansas defense, we. I don't need to point out that they're bad. Everybody knows that Kansas is not good at football. But aside from that near miracle at Oklahoma, and even in that game, they gave up 35 points in the second half. Um, They just gave up 55 to Oklahoma State. They gave up 41 to Texas Tech, 59 to Iowa State, and 52 to Duke of all teams. So if Duke can put up 52 points on them, Kansas State can probably put up a 100-burger. I think, yeah, they're more than capable of dropping just 40 This rivalry game, I know I mentioned how TCU-Baylor rivalry game changes things. This rivalry game doesn't even count until basketball season starts. This is not even a real rivalry game. Kansas State's won 12 straight in this series. They're about to make it 13. About to drop 40. That that finishes out Tier 2. So to recap for Tier 2, we have Wake Forest plus 2.5 at North Carolina. Then we got Rutgers plus 13.5 versus Wisconsin at home. Then we got TCU at home, plus seven versus Baylor. And last but not least, Kansas State team total over 40.5 at Kansas. 
Oh, gee, are we going to hit a 50-minute mark? Oh, gee, golly. I got to get through these uh, Tier 1 picks. All right, so Tier 1 has been killing it. Like, absolutely, without a doubt, phenomenal. I need to go... I need to go back and actually track my tier one specifically record. Cause I think in like the last five weeks, we've had maybe two or three losses in tier one. It's been, it's been nuts. We've been killing it. So I'm a little cautious to have four picks in it, but this might be my favorite one of the entire card. I'm going Oklahoma state at West Virginia under 49. Now this is the strays from the stereotype of big 12 overs, but this is a new era. It's a, especially a new era for Oklahoma state playing defensive branded football. Um, you know, on the defensive side, they've been out of control. They rank 11th in the country um, in terms of yards per play allowed with 4.6. They also have the number six ranked rush defense allowing, oh, never mind. Sorry, I misread my own stat. Uh, they do have the number six ranked rush defense, which is a great matchup for West Virginia, who's only been averaging 3.8 yards per carry as a team. And... Yeah, if, if this is like anything like in the second half of the TCU game for West Virginia, then they're going to play slow. They're, their pace of play is not that quick, not what it used to be back in like the Tavon Austin days. Uh, right now, West Virginia ranks 96th in plays per minute run per game. So could be slow paced. Oklahoma State is also running the ball a lot more. They run it 62% of the time, which that's going to chew clock. And at the meantime, I don't know why they're running it 62% of the time because they're only getting 3.8 yards per carry, and they rank outside of the top 80 in rushing success rate. So they keep pounding the rock, though. Um, so all in all, both teams have been leaning towards the under for the variety or entirety of the season, excuse me. Oklahoma State has hit the over twice, the under five times. Meanwhile, West Virginia has hit the over three times, same under five times as well. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> So regardless of who comes out on top of this game, I think it's going to be a dogfight, and it's going to be a low-scoring dogfight at that. It's going to be back and forth, slow pace, lots of running. We'll see. So give me the under 49 in that one. <coughs> <coughs> Ooh, Jeez Louise. Next up, we're going with a money line now, the rare money line pick. But it's basically the normal juice you'd get for any other spread bet. So... We're taking Kentucky minus 110 at home versus Tennessee. Kentucky is by far, this, this line is almost laughable. That's why it's in my tier at one. Kentucky is by far the better team here. Um, I understand they lost in Starkville last week and Georgia, which you can't get mad at them about. But S S Tennessee? Seriously? Tennessee, of all people, to be a pick em with Kentucky. Tennessee is your choice, odds makers. You know, usually I like to say you guys know what you're doing, but I feel like here you really don't know what you're doing. And those are famous last words, of course. I'm probably going to bite my ass saying that. Just Tennessee, though, we've been talking about sabermetrics a lot, so let's bring some more numbers in here. Tennessee, their defense is 110th in tackling, 86th in finishing drives, which is a perfect matchup for Kentucky, who is 7th in that same category offensively in finishing drives. So, And as well, I've already talked about the Kentucky defense and in old episodes, but they're solid. At one point, they were a top 10 defense. I think right now they're the 33rd overall ranked defense. Um, they mostly have been struggling in the passing game here and there, which Tennessee really isn't that big of a threat through the air, so it doesn't worry me too much. Tennessee really isn't a threat anywhere. Tennessee chokes everything. Uh, if this was a bigger spread, it would maybe have been a different situation, but if it's just a straight-up pick -em game, I'm going – Kentucky over Tennessee seven days a week, twice on a Sunday. Now, 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 two more picks. And next up, we have Marshall minus one at home versus FAU, Florida Atlantic. So the Thundering Herd have had a relatively disappointing season so far. I think they're five and three. This is why I say relatively, but. And there's no way, though, in this game, regardless of how many times they've lost, who they lost to, there's no way Marshall should only be one-point favorites. They have a clear edge here. Um, that This is also going to be a great game because both of these teams are currently tied at the top of Conference USA. And not to be cheesy, but 
it, it's really going to come down to who wants it more and, and the more proven team. And that's Marshall. Marshall is the more proven team, at least as of late. They've been there, done that kind of. Whereas FAU, even with Lane Kiffin, was never fantastic. So, yeah, FAU's coming off a close win to UTEP, where uh, of all teams, they got outgained by UTEP. They won the game, but they got outgained 443 to 280. That's that's wild. I, I couldn't imagine UTEP putting over 400 yards on my defense. But And then Marshall, too, on the other side of the ball, has just been one of the most efficient offenses in the country. But they're Conference USA, so nobody talks about them. They're 13th in total success rate in the country, and they just have a very balanced attack. I mean, you got – there's six receivers on that lineup with over 200 yards. And also their running back, Rasheen Ali, is seventh in the country with 574 yards after contact. So they're an all-around team. They can they can hurt you through the air, on the ground, whichever way you please. But I like Marshall in this one. I'm surprised that they're only one-point favorites. Um, and also FS, FAU, sorry, I almost said FSU. But sure, FAU's offense is, is relatively decent usually. But Marshall's probably the best defense they've played all year. And the only comparison would be UAB. And they put up 14 points against UAB. So give me Marshall. And then now we have one more pick to round out the card, which is good because I just realized my freaking hat's hurting my head with these headphones. Oh, damn. We almost made it an hour, though, actually. It doesn't look like we're going to make it. But last but not least, we're taking Florida at South Carolina over 53 this one, I have been going diving deep into Saber Metrics, all these numbers. This one is stri- strictly just somewhat of a gut feeling. Uh, I think this is it's bounce back time for Florida. They're going to put up crazy points, even though they're on the road. Uh, I, again, almost took Florida's team total here. But I feel like in this situation, the over-under might be a little bit safer because, you know, South Carolina has a home field advantage. They may get a couple points, may get an early score. Who knows? College football, I've seen a bunch of weird shit. It happens. But they Florida put up seven points last week. But it's Georgia's defense, so it's okay. We're just going to forget like it never happened. It's an excuse. Um, nobody knows right now as well for Florida's offense whether or not Anthony Richardson will be playing because Dan Mullen canceled all of the media access. So either way, they're going to put up points, I think. So this game is just all in all a gut feeling. I'm, I'm taking the under. I think South Carolina can maybe get at least one or two back. So. That is going to round out my card. Just to recap, Tier 1, we got Oklahoma State at West Virginia under 49, Kentucky minus 110 versus Tennessee, Marshall minus 1 versus FAU, and last but not least, Florida at South Carolina over 53. All righty. That is it for my week. I think it's week 10. I get lost in the weeks with all the NFL, college football. I think it's week 10. We're going to roll with week 10. There goes my week 10 card. Uh, be, be sure to follow me on social media. If you're watching the YouTube, you see it on the screen there or that way. Yep. At Ryan Bunnell eight on, I believe every platform that is my username. So keep up with me on there. I typically tweet some of my picks from time to time. So I might be tweeting out this card as well. We'll see, but yeah, let me know in the comment section, what you guys are betting, what your favorite game to watch, what, what your parlays are this weekend. Love seeing comments in the comment section. And also I will see everybody at AMG Carter Stadium this weekend when we beat the hell out of Baylor. All right, that, that is all I got for you. Thank you guys for listening. I will be back next Friday again with my full card of college football.